morning. Welcome to Shannon Hills Bible Chapel, uh, everyone that is here and also the ones that are joining us via the live stream. I'd like to encourage you, if you'd like, to stand as we sing our opening song, Are You Washed in the Blood? Stand if you'd like. to go over a few announcements with you. Just uh, one thing, make sure each one you, you can get a bulletin. They have plenty of them out in the hallway, on the table. Actually, I think on the little table right at the back of the auditorium. And today, today's version has the calendar on the back of it for the month. So just, uh, just draw your attention to that. Lots of information uh, in there about the going on of the assembly here. Uh, tonight at 6 p.m., is our evening meeting. Our brother Rob White will be speaking, uh, also having the su summer access for kids. That's ages 4 to 11 here. There's also nursery provided. After the meeting, it says in the bulletin there's a young adults potluck uh, and trivia night following. That'll be at 715. I've been informed by the uh, leader of the uh, young adults group there that young adults is well, my mom's coming, so, you know, so if you, if you, she's, you, that means most of you here, pretty much everyone here qualifies, right? So anyone, it's open to everyone. Tonight, there's a potluck after the evening meeting and trivia night, uh, I'm assuming up in the activity building. And then uh, 7 p.m. on Wednesday is our midweek prayer meeting. We'll have a devotional by Mark Shelley at that time. Also, Bible school's coming up, uh, Vacation Bible School, and uh, the there's details about that in the bulletin, and if you can help with that, please see Patty Murdoch. I'd like to ask you if you want anyone that has a birthday this week, if anyone has a birthday this week, to come up. Someone's, I see some fingers pointing. Different people that might need to uh, come up for their birthday. 
find out who they are. We won't ask you your age, okay? We won't ask that. All right. Oh, wow. We've got a few folks. Let's find out these, these people's names. Mark Shelley. Thomas Marlowe. He's here uh, under protest. But <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Whittemore. Okay. We're good to, good to uh, have Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you.
at this time. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together, to gather together as a group of believers and to sing praises to you, to sit under the sound of your word. Uh, we just pray to bless our time together and bless our meeting here. May it be fruitful. May we be edified in your name. We pray that you would uh, be with the Sunday school classes as the children are taught. May they be, learn more about yourself. Father, it may all be done for your honor and glory this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to encourage you to stand again, if you'd like, as we continue our singing and praise. <laughs> Soon and very soon, my King is coming, robed in righteousness and crowned with love. When I see Him, I shall be made like Him. Soon and very soon, soon and very soon.
that fine singing, it's my privilege now to turn the remainder of the meeting over to your brother, Mark Shelley. Good morning. As always, a great joy to be with you, uh, to have the opportunity to share together uh, fellowship and to share in the Word of God and prayer. And earlier this morning, the breaking of bread. Uh, for those of you who were here, a uh, blessed time of remembering uh, the Lord Jesus. This morning, I'd like to ask you to turn uh, to the book of Job. Uh, if you were here last Sunday morning, you hear, heard our brother Dave Steenlin as he uh, gave an overview and some applications from this book. Uh, I didn't know he was going to be speaking on the book of Job. He didn't know I was going to be speaking on the book of Job starting this morning. Uh, but guess who did know? That's right, the Lord knew. The Lord knew and he directed in that. And I appreciate his introduction very much. Uh, we were talking the other night as we uh, shared about our uh, common thoughts on the book of Job. And uh, both of our uh, attentions were turned to the book of Job as we were reading uh, through it recently back in the uh, month of May and into the, book, into the month of June uh, with our reading together uh, as a local church. Some of you are involved in that. Uh, reading, and we encourage you to do that. It's in the bulletin. You can keep up with it that way uh, as well. And uh, anyway, it, both, it spoke to both of our hearts, and I've been really been challenged regarding doing a series uh, on this book. So we're going to be looking at the Old Testament book of Job, and I'd really like to use this theme as we go through the book of Job. We'll see it uh, this morning, and it'll, it's the title of our time together this morning, but I would really uh, like to use this phrase from the lips of Job uh, to be our overarching theme for this book of 42 chapters, and it's this, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'm going to ask you to say that with me right now, if you would. One, two, three. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I hope that is your heart, and I hope it will be your heart even more as we work our way through this book. A very quick overview, uh, just not, we're not going to look at this right now, but just to kind of give you an idea of the book, this is not necessarily the way that we're going to be uh, looking at it, but we're going to look this morning uh, at chapters 1 and 2, and then we're going to see the background of Job's suffering, really the background of the whole book, and then we're going to see from chapter 2 through chapter to the beginning of chapter 32. That's a lot of chapters with debates between Job and his three friends. Uh, many of us are familiar with the first two chapters of Job. Uh, many of us are familiar with the last few chapters of Job. But oftentimes, these uh, many chapters, 30-some in between, uh, we're familiar with a verse here and a verse there, and there are some powerful, beautiful verses that speak of the Lord Jesus uh, that we'll see. But we want to get in a little deeper into these debates and ask the Lord to guide us in that. And then we will find a monologue uh, by Elihu uh, there toward the end of those chapters. Uh, and then, of course, the dialogue between the Lord and Job, uh, which brings things to a powerful climax. And then we'll find the Lord rebuking uh, Job's three friends, see what we can learn from that. And finally, we find the Lord restoring uh, Job uh, there in the last part of the last chapter, uh, chapter 42. So just as we, as we look at that overview, I just want to uh, pause again to pray and just ask God's blessing on our study of this book of Job. Father, thank you for the time we've shared together this morning. Thank you for the songs that have been selected and have been sung and that we've been able to join with. And now, Father, as we look into your word, we pray that you will work in us. Father, your word is alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, we want to open up our minds, our hearts right now, as well as our ears, asking you to pierce 
deep within us through the Scriptures. Lord, you know what you want to teach us. Please do that. Guide my words this morning, and we commit this time to you in this study of Job into your hands. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Uh, one of the um, most interesting books that I have read in my life is entitled Into Thin Air. I don't know if any of you have read this book by John Krakauer. It um, tells the story of the ill-fated expedition in 1996 to the summit of Mount Everest. And John Krakauer, a writer, was actually uh, on that expedition. Uh, one uh, particular character in that, uh, J. Kent Edwards, uh, in his book Deep Preaching, uh, brings out the thought of Yasuko Namba. Yasuko Namba was one of the members of this expedition. Uh, she was a 46-year-old Japanese FedEx employee with a passion for climbing. She was a very accomplished climber. She had reached the summits of seven of the largest mountains on the planet. Anybody else been able to do that? I didn't think so. And not here, anyone. Anyway, uh, the only one left for her to conquer was Mount Everest, of course, the tallest in the world. And she desperately wanted to get to the top of Mount Everest. That was her goal. So much that Krakauer, who, as I mentioned, was also a member of that expedition, tells how she was totally focused on the top, he wrote. It was as almost as if she was in a trance. She pushed extremely hard, jostling her way past everyone to the front of the line. She wanted to get to the top of Everest, end quote. Later that day, she made it. She accomplished her goal. She was the oldest person ever to make it to the highest point in the world. But as the book so vividly portrays, later that afternoon, Yasuko and a number of the other climbers were caught in a terrible blizzard. And as the icy winds blew, Yasuko succumbed to the exhaustion of her climb, and she froze to death. She died agonizingly close in time and location to where she wanted to be, the tents, the camp. This helps explain her tragic mistake. According to Krakauer, her fatal flaw was that she adopted the wrong goal. Her goal had been to get to the top of the mountain. What she wanted the most was to stand at the top of the world and all of Japan cheered her when she did that, but it was the wrong goal. It's a frequent and sometimes fatal mistake that some climbers make. The goal of climbing should never be to get to the top of a summit. Successful climbers know that the goal is not to get to the top, it's to get back down to the bottom. Against incredible odds, she made it to the top of the mountain, but as she poured out her energy to get to the top, she did not save enough strength to make it back down. She failed because she adopted the wrong goal. This morning, as we begin our study of the book of Job, I would like for us to consider together four goals that we see in the beginning of the book of Job. We're going to look at Job's initial goal, Satan's infernal goal, the Lord's intentional goal, and your inspirational goal. So here in Job chapter 1, first of all, we want to consider Job's initial goal. And to do that, we're going to be looking at a couple of verses. But I want us to go ahead and if you would follow along while I read chapter 1 of Job. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. 
Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered to the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does God, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Job's initial goal, and I think we can see it there in verses 20 and 21 that we just read. But first of all, very quickly, a few things that we learn about Job in the first five uh, verses of this chapter. Uh, We learn his location, the land of Uz. Uh, We're not sure exactly where this is, but uh, based on the fact that the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans were both able to come in and uh, uh, raid him, uh, very likely it was east of the promised land promised uh, of modern day Israel. Uh, We're not, neither are we confident about when Job lived, although most folks believe that it was around the time of Jacob. Uh, Very likely, if this is true, then Job would have had zero words from the Bible, okay? Because Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, And Moses was not born until over 400 years later. His name was Job. Uh, The Hebrew pronunciation is Eov. It means persecuted. We learn about his character. Uh, We find there in verse 1 that he was blameless. Uh, He was a man whose reputation and testimony was such that if you made an accusation against him, in the community it wouldn't stick. Because he was blameless. He wasn't perfect, 
he sinned, but he had a blameless reputation. He was upright. He was a man who lived in a way that matched the righteous demands of God. Again, not perfectly, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He was a man who feared God. He reverenced God. He respected God as creator, as authority, as sovereign. He had a relationship with God, though he did not have the Word of God. In written form, he feared God. And fourthly, we see that his character is marked by the fact that he shunned evil. He avoided sin. He sought to flee from sin. We find out a little bit about his family there in verses 2 through 5. He was married, and he and his unnamed wife had ten children together, seven sons and three daughters who obviously shared close relationships and spent a lot of time together feasting, it appears, for extended periods. We see Job's heart for his children's relationships with the Lord there in verse 5. He acted as a priest for them. The the, uh, Old Testament priesthood, again, uh, did not come into being until 400 years or more later. Uh, But Job acted as a priest. He went and he offered up burnt offerings for his children, concerned that possibly they had cursed God in their hearts. And we see his possessions there in verse 3. Livestock. He had a large household, it appears, that cared for his animals, many servants. He was the greatest man in that part of the world, the known world at that time. And now we go on to his initial goal. Uh, What an unbelievable day of tragedy. Verses 13 to 19. Uh, Unbelievable what he had dealt with as one servant after another came with bad news Worse news, even worse news, and then maybe the worst news of all. Job had to choose how he would respond. Now, Job was a human being. Surely he was affected by his thoughts and his emotions. Can you remember a time in your life where something that you valued was taken suddenly from you? Maybe it was a possession. Maybe it was a position. Maybe it was a person. Can you think back in your life about how you felt and what your initial response was? Can you imagine? Can we touch the hem of the garment of what Job must have thought and how he must have felt? Can we enter at all into his experience? And in that, Job's initial goal is declared. His initial goal there in verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. I had nothing when I came into this world, and when I leave this world, I'm going to leave everything behind. That's the essence of what he was saying. The Lord gave... And the Lord has taken away. He recognized God as the giver of every gift. And God with the right to take away any and every gift if he chooses. But then he closes this declaration with these words. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Job declared that the Lord's name is to be blessed. The Lord's name is similar to your name. And I could call out your full name, and people in this room who know you would have certain thoughts come to their mind. I wonder what those thoughts would be. If your name was called out this morning, what thoughts would come to people's mind. Uh, That's what your name represents. It's your character. It's your reputation. Your name is your identity. It's a mark of your individuality. It implies your character. It represents who you are. I say Benedict Arnold, and if you know much about history or anything almost about history, 
you think about a traitor. When I mention George Washington, you think about a great hero, the father, as it were, of our nation. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that was the heart of Job. As he started out this journey, losing everything, he desired that God's name would be well spoken of. Uh, This word blessed comes from the word to kneel. He worshipped. He wanted the name of God to be adored no matter what. We read that he worshipped. He worshipped God. He fell down in grief. And he bowed down in worship. His heart was broken. And yet he had a goal. His goal was that God's name would be blessed. That, That is an honorable goal. That is an amazing goal. None of us have ever had a day like Job had experienced. How would we respond? How do I respond? When something relatively small and insignificant in my life is taken away from me, how do I respond? I'm ashamed to say how often I respond. Is my initial goal that of Job's? That even in suffering, that the name of the Lord, the person of the Lord, who God is, His character, His attributes, His ways, His works, His purposes, would be well spoken of even in my pain, even in my suffering. Job was in the midst of suffering. His wealth is gone. His children are dead. He had no idea this was coming. It hit him like an invisible and silent locomotive. He flinched. He faltered. But he did not fail. But this was round one of a two-round bout. In chapter 2, We continue our reading. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. He still held fast to his integrity. C.S. Lewis says integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Job's heart was to bless God's name no matter what. And even though now not only had his possessions been taken, not only had his children been ripped from him, but now his own body had been stricken. But nonetheless, his initial goal remains clear. Now as we go through the book, we'll see this goal possibly shifting, but it's his initial goal right now as he begins his journey. He desires that God's name will be blessed, and wisdom looks ahead. 
to determine our goal to always be the glory of God. May our goal always be the glory of God. That was the heart of Job. That was his initial goal at this point in his suffering. What wisdom. You know, Job is the first of the wisdom books, as they're called in the Old Testament. Job, and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Wisdom books. We see great wisdom on this great man Job. In his great suffering, he looks ahead. He desires that his goal, he determines that his goal will be the glory of God. That's Job's initial goal. But secondly, we also see another goal, Satan's infernal goal. Satan's infernal goal. Satan's name means adversary. Uh, this word that in the Hebrew is translated Satan is also used in the Old Testament as a common noun to identify angels and people who oppose another person. As a proper noun, as we find it here in the first two chapters of Job, it designates this spiritual being that we also know as the devil, Lucifer, Beelzebub, Apollyon, Abaddon, the old serpent, the great red dragon, the accuser of our brethren, the father of lies, the god of this age, the prince of the power of the air, the roaring lion, the tempter, the wicked one, the ruler of the demons, a thief, and more. In Job, he has identified as Satan, an adversary of God. He resists God. He opposes God. He seeks to withstand God and seeks to derail God's plans. Satan's goal in the book of Job is revealed during the two direct appearances that we have of Satan in this book. One in chapter 1 that we read, one in chapter 2. We see over in chapter 1 and verse 6, the sons of God presenting themselves before the Lord can look back in Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 and 4, and also forward into Job verse, uh, chapter 38, verse 7. And there you will find the sons of God referring to angelic beings. They may be angels of God. They may be angels who have fallen, who are cast out of heaven, following Satan in his rebellion. But we find that these sons of God are appearing before the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, we read that there is no creature hidden from God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account, even the demons. They're open before God. A no creature, not even a demon, is hidden from his sight. And Satan is there. And he is individually addressed by the Lord in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And he asks Satan where he has been. Now the Lord is omniscient. He knows exactly where Satan has been. But his question directs attention to the fact that Satan has been on the earth walking to and fro among the people of the earth, and there he most likely would have seen Job. And this provides a logical opportunity for the Lord to hold up his servant Job as unique among all the humans alive at that time. Have you considered my servant Job? We find Satan's goal. Uh, did you notice there? I'm sure you did that in verse 9, he begins to challenge God regarding Job. Does Job fear God for nothing? You see, uh, Satan assumes and accuses that Job's motivation for holiness is what he gets from God. Now, what a challenge for us. What is my motivation for holiness? 
Is it what I can get from God as an eternal vending machine? Satan proposes that if Job is hurt emotionally and financially, what will Job do? He will curse God. That is Satan's goal. Throughout the book of Job is that Job will curse God. That Job will speak evil of God. That he will curse his name. This is an infernal goal. Something that is infernal is characteristic of hell. And that is the heart of Satan, that Job would curse God, that you would curse God, that I would curse God. Preferably with our lips, but not with, if not with our lips, at least with our lives. Something very interesting, and we're not, we don't have time to really go into this, but something very interesting in the Hebrew language is that in the book of Job, the word bless and the word curse are the same word. They're the same word. We have to look at the context, and again, both of them come from this idea of kneeling. A possibly kneeling for a blessing or kneeling for a cursing. Job's heart, Job's mind was to bless God. Satan's goal was to curse God. So after Job's initial blessing of the Lord's name is declared here at the end of chapter 1, blessed be the name of the Lord Satan, again in chapter 2, is appearing before the Lord, and he proposes turning up the heat to take Job's health. And in verse 5 of chapter 2, he says to the Lord, He will surely curse you to your face. The quartet saying, Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, God permitted the adversary to touch Job's body this time. And the worst that the fallen angel could throw at Job found its mark on Job from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Every inch of his body was covered with a miserable inflammation. So bad that he took a bro broken piece of pottery sitting in probably what was the city dump where the trash was burned and he's scraping his body. He is in so much pain and agony and shame. Humiliation and physical suffering like he had never experienced. Would he curse God now? Remember the fear of Job's heart with his children? Would they curse God in their hearts? And now at the end of chapter 2, his own wife is counseling him to curse God and go ahead and die. Let go of your integrity. The temptation to, for Job to curse God surely was strong from the human perspective and maybe even understandable. But he sought to be wise. He sought to accept all that God chose for him. And he did not sin with his lips. I wonder if that gives us a possible glimpse into what might have been going on in Job's mind and his heart. Though not yet expressed through his lips. We'll have to stay tuned to find out more about Job and what's going on. But Satan does not want the Lord of glory to receive His deserved glory. Rather, He wants God's people to practically curse God by dishonoring God through unbelief, through doubt, through not living by faith, in essence, taking the name of God in vain, calling ourselves followers of the Lord Jesus and not living as such. Satan's goal is to resist God as his adversary. And he was working diligently, and he is working diligently to influence us to distrust the Lord and to pursue the things of the flesh and of the Lord. Trying to get into our heads uh, as if uh, athletes 
in a sporting contest trying to get into each other's head to sow doubts about that player's ability, uh, that game, the coach's game plan. That is what Satan is seeking to do. But Satan's attempts to harm us. And we see this here in chapters 1 and 2 of Job. They are designed by him to turn us against God, but even in that he is limited by God. He can only do to us what God will allow him to do to us. And that brings us to the third goal that we'll look at, and it's the Lord's intentional goal in the book of Job. I'm going to ask you to turn, hold your place. Well, you don't even have to hold your place here. Go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, there are two other portions in the Word of God where we find Job mentioned. Some people say Job uh, was not an actual person, not historical, but rather he was a parable. But we find uh, Ezekiel, uh, we find the Lord speaking of Job along with Noah and Daniel in the book of Ezekiel. But also we find here in the book of James uh, a very instructive passage in chapter 5 of James. We're going to be looking at verse 11, but as we go through this study, uh, I may refer back to some really excellent verses and tie-ins here. Uh, but we find that the Lord has uh, his own intentional goal in allowing Job to go through this and allowing Satan to do what he does. It's interesting, the writer of the book of James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, uh, let me share a quote of his for you from Acts chapter 15 and verse 18. Here's what he says, Known to God from eternity are all his works. Known to God from eternity are all his works. From eternity past, God already knew what was going to occur in the life of Job and in your life. God's plan is from eternity. No beginning because he has no beginning. His goal is perfect even though we might not be able to comprehend it. And in his provocation of Satan, the Lord is clearly in control. He knows in advance how Satan's going to react and what Satan will say. God is sovereign. He rules over all. And in his authority, he causes events and he also allows events. And Satan has freedom to a certain degree to harm the people of God. But we see that in that, he still has to submit to the restrictions that God puts on him. Now, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. I encourage you to use commentaries to help you understand the Word of God. But the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And as we look at James' comment here, I want you to notice in verse 11, Indeed, we count them blessed... Who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. Now, that word end there uh, really speaks of the goal, okay? It's the intention. And here is God's intentional goal that the Lord is very compassionate. And merciful. I want to suggest that the Lord's goal for Job and us is to reverence him as very compassionate and merciful. It's interesting to me that these are the specific attributes that God desired Job to see and acknowledge in him. Now, there are many other attributes of God that we will see displayed throughout the book of Job. And the first that would come to our mind, we've already mentioned, is the sovereignty of God. But what God really wanted Job to understand, and what I believe he wants us to understand, is that he is very compassionate and merciful. The Lord Jesus is our great high priest. And in Hebrews we read that he sympathizes with us. He really does understand your pain. He really does enter into your suffering alongside you. 
He knows and is involved and is present with you in your suffering. And He wants you to know Him in a very personal and intimate way so that you can and will trust Him no matter what you go through. That you will endure like Job endured with strength that it for, is forged in the furnace of suffering. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, Peter wrote, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God intends, brother and sister, that your faith will result in praise, honor, and glory to Jesus Christ. Therefore, He wants you to know Him as He is, all that He is. And in the context of suffering, it is so important that we know Him as very compassionate and merciful. That He pities us. That He hurts for us. That He understands our pain. And His goal is that our knowledge of Him will motivate us to endure hardship for Him. Because He cares. God is purposeful. And everything He allows into your life. And you can know that everything He allows into your life, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, you can be sure that the Lord Jesus understands. And He knows. And He's allowed this into your life for good purposes. And He does so with great compassion. He is not unfeeling. When he allows difficulty into your life, he is not unmerciful. No, he knows you, he loves you, and that brings us to our close and our last goal. And it's your inspirational goal. In Romans 15 and verse 4, we read that whatever things were written before in the Scriptures were written for our learning. God has it here for a purpose that we can take these truths and apply them to our lives. And as we close, I want to encourage you to pause to consider what does the Lord have for you in this study of the book of Job. Maybe you've studied it deeply before. What does He have fresh for you? Maybe you've never read the book of Job. What does He have for you in this book? At the very outset of this wisdom book, what goal does God want you to set? Not only the goal of greater knowledge, that's important, but not only to know the Word of God better, but also to know God better. What goal does He want for you to set? A goal that will inspire you Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job's initial goal was to bless God no matter what. Satan's infernal goal is to curse God no matter what. The Lord's intentional God goal is to reveal Himself so that we will trust Him no matter what. So what is your inspirational goal? What does God want you to learn from Job no matter what? I'm going to ask you to bow your head. We're going to just meditate for a moment of silence and I'm going to close this in a brief prayer and then we're going to have a, just a, a, a verse played as you continue to meditate on this. What does God want for us in the book of Job? Father, as we close this morning and as we listen to this music played, I pray that you will burn into our hearts and our minds a goal or multiple goals that you want for us in our lives as we dive into this book of Job. Father, this great book of wisdom. Father, this man Job has, has gone through more than we can even begin to imagine and yet his heart was to bless your name. And, and Father, we know that your name is worthy to be blessed and honored. You are worthy of glory and blessing. 
And in heaven, we're going to sing that. Blessing be to you, our God. Father, may that be our heart now. Father, help us as we seek your goal for us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen.